Hey everybody and welcome. As many of you know, I am about to release, with the help of Chip Theory Games, uh, the program I wrote that will allow you all to uh, play Too Many Bones on your Windows PC uh, at no cost to you, courtesy of Chip Theory Games. Uh, I've been working over the past several months um, developing this and finalizing it. Maybe you've seen some of my earlier videos, tutorials, uh, with a very early version of this program. This is near release now. As I, I'm recording this about two weeks prior to releasing this, uh, the, we spent the last uh, four to five weeks uh, beta testing this uh, pretty thoroughly, and we think we've gotten most of the bugs out of it. And today, uh, well, first of all, let me say that if you want a complete understanding of how the program works so that you'll be using it to its, your, its fullest potential, then I would direct you to watch the video playlist that I put together that uh, walks you through all the functionality of the program from A to Z and shows you basically how to do everything in a bunch, in, in a series of uh, some 14 short videos, each of which cover a specific topic. If you really want to know how to use the program, I would encourage you to watch that uh, video playlist. You can, it's, all, it's live now. It has been for the past couple of weeks. I've been tinkering with it and um, cleaning some parts up and, and updating other parts as, as the program has evolved over the course of the beta testing. Uh, so I would encourage you to watch that if you can, and I will include a link to that video playlist in the notes, in the show notes for this video. This is really aimed at a, um, a new player to, of Too Many Bones who is just trying out the program to see if they like the game. Maybe they'll uh, fall in love with it the way I have and the way so many other people have and will go ahead and, and uh, purchase it. Um, but you can, even if you're an experienced player, you, could, uh, you can still watch this video to get an idea of of how the program works and the different kinds of things you can do with it, you are not going to see a complete um, review of, of the entire program and all of its uh, capabilities, but uh, you should get a pretty good understanding of how it works. If you are a new player of Too Many Bones and this is your first solo game, you're going to want to start with number of gear locks equal to one. You're going to want to play a full solo mission, one gear lock. Although, as you can see, this program allows you to play with two gear locks, three gear locks, four gear locks, whatever the case may be. Um, so, uh, you know, as you get better and better uh, at the game, uh, you can continue to challenge yourself. Uh, if you don't already know, the game ships with two encounter decks, one aimed at purely a solo player who is playing with one gear lock, and then there's a separate deck of cards that's aimed, uh, that's aimed at a solo player playing with multiple gear locks or a multiplayer game. Today we're going to do one gear lock. Now, the next step is to pick the tyrant you're going to be facing. And there are seven, seven different tyrants in the game, radically different, very different skills. I'm going to suggest if you're new to the game that you're going to play against Molmesh for your first game. Number nine here indicates that in order to win the game, we need to defeat Molmesh within nine days nine, generally speaking, nine separate encounters. Um, for the most part, it's one encounter per day. But we can't challenge Molmesh in the, uh, in the battle arena, if you will, until we've achieved six progress points. We need to meet that criteria before we can uh, go up against Molmesh. Figure that we're going to spend about six days or so getting those six progress points and then maybe we'll, depending upon the situation, we'll either uh, uh, skill up for one more encounter in day seven, uh, or if we feel strong enough, we'll go right after Molmesh in day seven with the understanding that if we fail uh, uh, in battle with him in day seven, we still have day eight to try again. And if we fail there, we still have day nine to try uh, uh, one last time. Hopefully, uh, we're going to make this game, this is going to be a beginner game, so it's going to be easy enough. I think that we shouldn't have too much trouble. Uh, this is all, this is, mo you know, th th this video is all about just demonstrating the program 
and presenting the uh, the game and the program to new players and experienced players alike. But uh, uh, it's not about you're not you're not watching this to gain any strategic uh, uh, expertise or get any great ideas or watch you know a professional uh, player of too many bones at the helm. Uh, instead, you're going to be watching me, this person who developed this program, uh, with the help of a lot of great people. So you know, don't expect any brilliance. But now every every uh, tyrant brings with them a series of minions called baddies in the game, uh, and some are worse than others. And in, uh, there are, I think, six or seven different clans or tribes, if you will, of um, uh, baddies. And Molmesh brings the beasts, the bogs, and the scales. And each tyrant has a different selection, uh, some with more baddies than others. Uh, Drellin, for example, uh, comes with bogs and uh, goblins and beasts. And by the time you get down to Duster, you can see that uh, she's, she's bringing lots of different kind of baddies with her. So Momesh has these three types. Uh, and uh, I can click this card to look at the other side. So when we're ready to fight Momesh, this is the side of the card that we're going to have to focus on to get a good idea of how he works, what his skills are, and uh, basically how an encounter with Molmesh goes. Now we have to pick uh, the gear lock we want to uh, be in this game. And I have sorted these uh, in order, arguably, from easier for an, a new player to harder, with patches and picket and you know, nugget to be somewhat easy to work with. Gilly and Boomer, I would say, are medium. Uh, Tantrum is more advanced, and and uh, I think a lot of people would agree with me that Tink is probably the hardest of all the gear locks uh, to learn and to uh, to play. Uh, so for today's uh, game, I think we're going to play with Pickett. Uh, Pickett's a tank character. Patch is a, is a medic. The gear locks in this game, there's seven of them, of course, are all very asymmetrical. Their skills are radically different from one another, and that's part of the joy of the game, that uh, uh, learning this game is as much learning how the game works as it is learning and studying and get, getting good with uh, a specific gear lock. Okay, there are three different modes you can play in. Normal mode, which is normal. Uh, casual mode, which gives you a free training point, and you'll find out what that is soon enough, uh, before the game even begins. And uh, you also get one extra health for your gear lock when you're playing casual mode. But we're new players uh, to this game, so today we're going to be playing in the greenhorn mode, where we do get still get that free training point, but we also get two extra health. You know, even in Greenhorn mode, uh, many new players play this game and they are blown away a little bit uh, because there's, one, because they're new to the game, and two, because the game can be a little bit mean, uh, I, I would say, un un until you kind of get your, get some experience under your belt. So I've added some other ways to make the game easier, and that's what we're going to do today. There are three boxes that you can adjust to uh, handicap the baddies, and this first one is HP or hit points, health points, if you will. Uh, if I put, if I click this box and put a minus one in the box, I'm basically saying that every baddie that comes into the game, including Momesh for that matter, will have one less health than they should. Uh, so it'll be a little bit easier to um, to defeat them. Furthermore, every baddie, uh, or most baddies, I should say, roll a certain number of attack dice when it's their turn. Uh, I'm going to put a minus one in this box as well. Uh, again, I'm left clicking. Um, generally speaking, a left click reduces and a right click increases. So if I left click, I'm down to minus one. If I left click again, I'm down to minus two. And then if I right click, I'm just going back the other direction. And I can even make the game harder if I wanted to, although I think it is hard enough, but if I wanted to, I could put some positive numbers in these boxes and really uh, make the game tough. 
but we're going to make the attack minus one. And, and uh, most baddies don't have any defense, but some, some do, especially when you get up to the more, the medium level and, and uh, advanced baddies. And of course, uh, uh, some of the tyrants as well. So we're going to put a minus one in defense because a, uh, so even the ones that do roll defense dice, we're going to knock those def the number of defense dice they roll by uh, one. Okay, I think we're ready to get started now. We've picked our gear lock. We've picked our tyrant. Uh, green horde mode. We're going in easy. Uh, I think this is a good place to start uh, when you're just getting your first taste of the game. Let's get underway. Okay, so we've gotten our two free health. Pickett normally starts with five health, but his health stat has been increased about to two. So his health is now seven. Uh, that, that helps. And as, you, as I mentioned earlier, we get one free train point of our choice. Now, I'll talk about what a train point is, but let me briefly mention that uh, when the program um, uh, pre presents reminders or other types of messages, they appear in this box at the top of the screen. Uh, when you want to, if you want, a lot of the messages will just go away on their own, but if you want to get rid of a message on your own, you can just click the box and it'll just go away. But you always have the uh, uh, the opportunity to click this button over here, last message, to see the last message, and in fact to click it multiple times to see the last umpteenth messages. Uh, that uh, in case uh, a couple went by and you wanted to go back and review them again. All right. So that about that free training point. Well, a training point can be of an uptick in one of their stats, or uh, adding one of their skill dice uh, to the game. So every gear lock comes with a set of 16 different skill dice, and they're oriented in what are called uh, professions. So uh, in this case, this is Pickett's captain profession, all the, these four skills. And you can see it's sort of like a tech tree. So we can't get this one shield form until we get stand ground because this is a prerequisite for this, as this is a prerequisite for sword advance as well. Uh, so the starred skills are those that you can get without having to worry about a prerequisite. The, um, the warden profession is down here. All four of these have stars, and these dice are very similar to one another just because it's, it happens to be Pickett, and that's the way Pickett's uh, skills are oriented. But uh, when, we, when we start using some of these skills, I'll talk more about how they work uh, together, uh, particularly if you can get more than one of them. Uh, we have the um, protector. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, yeah, I said this was the warden profession. This is the protector profession, if I'm reading that correctly. Uh, red shirt uh, is, a, is a prerequisite to getting intercept. Um, I don't know that we're going to be using these skills because these are really aimed at multiplayer types of uh, games. Uh, so uh, we may be ignoring these skills. And then lastly, there is uh, Pickett's hero profession down here. And uh, you can see that confidence is, uh, uh, you have to get confidence first before you can move into either tenacity or bravado. And then you have to get tenacity uh, in order to get into renown. Uh, every gear lock has a couple of yellow type uh, dice that are called consumables. They're not skills that you can get via a training point. They are, you have to get them in a different way. And uh, I'm sure uh, one of the methods of getting uh, one of those consumables will pop up over the course of this game. Okay, let's talk about stats. So we have a health stat, as you, I've already pretty much mentioned that. So we can bump this uh, up to three if we wanted to spend our train point right now to get Pickett's health up to eight. Dexterity represents the number of dice, or yeah, mostly for the most part, the number of dice you can roll when it's uh, your turn. When it's your turn in battle. Uh, so with uh, this dexterity of two, Pickett is limited to rolling two dice. Although moving on the battle mat over here on the right hand side of the screen when we're in a battle also costs dexterity. So if Pickett first moved a space and then wanted to roll against a target, he would only be able to uh, roll one die because he would have spent one dexterity already just for that movement step. 
Attack, uh, again, is the number of attack dice that Pickett can roll in battle. So right now it's one. If you want to win, uh, and, and defense is the number of defense dice that Pickett can roll in battle. Being a tank, he is uh, very big on defense and defensive shields and, and other defensive mechanisms. Uh, the, this profession is very much focused on um, having a lot of those uh, defensive shields, um, beefing all that up. Uh, but if you wanted to increase attack or defense, you have to go through what's called a training attempt first, and that's very simple. If we wanted to beef up the attack stat, we would first have to roll the number of attack dice that, we, that we're currently allowed to roll, in this case one, make sure that we don't get a bone, and if we don't get a bone after the roll, then we, we're successful and we can bump up the attack stat. So this is, an, this is an attack die down here, this gray die at the bottom, and if I control left click it, uh, the, my program is going to show you what all six sides or die faces look like. So one die face has a bone on it. This game's called Too Many Bones, so we're going to see a lot of bones. But bones are not necessarily bad, uh, uh, as you'll soon find out. There are, uh, there are four sides that have a, a, a single hit point, if you will, on them, and there's one side that has two hit points. So we have a one in six chance of failing the training attempt if we roll that bone. Uh, similarly, if we want to increase the defense stat, we have to roll two defense dice. If we do get a bone uh, when we on the, in that first roll of the two defense dice in this example, uh, we can we get one chance uh, for, for for defense to roll those dice uh, with the bones one more time. Uh, to uh, see if we can go without bones, and if we do, then we, uh, we succeed at the training attempt. And the reason behind that is because uh, if I, again, control left click on this, you'll see that a, a typical defense die has two sides with bones, three sides with a single shield, and uh, one side with a double shield. So that's why you get that extra reroll to make sure you don't get any bones. Now, of course, if we bumped up the attack stat by one, the next time we wanted to do a training attempt, we'd have to roll two attack dice and not get a bone. And same goes for the, for the defense. So that's one way of getting a training point, upticking one of these stats. And of course, another way is to just get a skill. Uh, particular, specifically, uh, one of the skills that is starred in the upper left-hand corner, uh, um, because if I try to get a, a, uh, a skill that I'm not allowed to get, uh, the program's going to complain. For my first training point, I, because we have, we're able to roll one attack die and two defense dice, and that's three dice, but our dexterity is only two, I think I'm, the, from the, for the first training point, I'm going to bump up dexterity by uh, by one for my training point. That does not require a training attempt. And again, to increase this box, I right click to decrease. You would never decrease a stat, but uh, if you had to because you made a mistake, you would left click it. So I'm going to right click this box, and now our dexterity is at three, and I have officially taken my training point, and now I'm ready to start the game. To start the game, we're going to come up here and draw a new encounter. But before I do, let me just briefly say, how did we come up with a 10-card encounter deck? And that's what this little box refers to, that there are 10 cards currently in the encounter deck. Well, the way you come up with the encounter deck is you uh, take the number of days before you lose, uh, if, you don't, if you haven't defeated them. So that's 9. You subtract 3. So that's 6. Then you shuffle in. Uh, so you draw 6 encounters. Then you shuffle in any tyrant encounters. Uh, associated with the tyrant. So every tyrant comes with one, two, or three very special uh, encounters that are uh, uh, very much directed at them. Uh, Momesh being an easier tyrant comes with one uh, tyrant encounter, but uh, Duster, for example, who is at the other end of the list, comes with three tyrant encounters. So we have six because we take nine minus three. We add Molmesh's Tyrant Encounter, which brings us up to seven cards. And then on top of that, uh, uh, then we shuffle those up. And then on top of that, we uh, place the three starting special encounters. The three encounters that you always start with when you're playing a game of Too Many Bones. They are meant to ease you into the game um, so that you don't get... Uh, 
blown away in your uh, in your first day of battle. So anyhow, that's how we came up with 10. 9 minus 3 plus Molmesh's uh, single tyrant encounter plus the three starting encounters brings us up to 10. And now I'm going to draw a new encounter, and it's going to be the first of those three special starting encounters called Leaving Obendar. As you can see, when I did that, when I clicked on Draw New Encounter, my day counter bumped up by one, so now we're in the first day. This is the flavor text side, or the story side of Leaving Omendar, and I am, I'm not going to read these, but I'm going to give you the, uh, uh, the option, of course, of pausing the video if you would like to read it. In any event, uh, I'm going to click, I'm going to right-click this uh, to flip the card over and see the other side. I can always uh, click Flip to do the same thing, and of course I have this zoom button too, so that uh, you can kind of zoom in if you really want, if you uh, want to see the card close up. Uh, but I'm going to right click, see the other side, and now this icon means no, there's no battles. This is a, this is like a freebie encounter. Um, as I said, these first three uh, special encounters are intended to ease you into the game. E and, norm and most encounters present you with two different choices. You pick one, and that's the one you go with. The choices we have for leaving Omendar are squeeze in some last-minute self-improvement, in which case we get two training points straight up, uh, or we can shake down a shady peddler, gain one training point, and also draw two loot, and uh, we get to choose one to keep, and then we discard the other. Regardless of whatever choice we make here, we are going to get whatever is shown down here, and this is the symbol for one progress point. So we're going to get this progress point practically for free. You can see this icon matches this icon being the uh, a, a progress point icon. So I think in it, we're, we're going to have lots of opportunity to get loot. I'm not too worried about that. Being that uh, I'm sort of aiming this at um, a new player, I think we're going to go with the first option, gain two training points. And uh, I think for those training points, we're probably going to go with some skills. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, uh, Pickett's Captain Profession, and I'm going to start with Stand Ground. Until you roll the die, you don't know what die face you're going to be working with. So the die face you see here is just the one that uh, my program decided to present to give you a good idea of what's, how Stand Ground works. Anytime you hover over a skill die, you're going to get a tip uh, a little some text at the top of the screen that tells you how that face of the skill die works. In this case, this is Pickett's constant regen uh, skill. The L in parentheses means it goes into a locked slot. Every gear lock has a number of lock slots and a number of active slots. Once a skill die is in a lock slot, it's going to stay there from day to day, encounter to encounter, um, unless you're knocked out or unless you're playing in greenhorn mode, and we're playing in greenhorn mode, so if we get something into a lock slot, the only way it's going to leave a lock slot is if we voluntarily decide to remove it, and we always have that option. Uh, on the other hand, anything that goes into an active slot uh, is only there for the course of the battle that you're currently participating in. At the end of the battle, it leaves the active slot, comes back to uh, the, its, its home, home space on the player map. I left, uh, control left click this die, you're going to see that there are four die faces that have bones, but there are very special kinds of bones. If you look at the tip of the top, they're reusable bones. When used as part of a backup plan, this die does not have to be exhausted, but instead can be returned to your player map. For the most part, most skills can only be used once, but there are lots of exceptions. Constant regen is a good one because it goes into a locked slot and it stays there and you get the ongoing benefit that it provides. Um, so what is this backup plan all about? Well, when you do roll bones, uh, you can put those bones in this area that called the backup plan, and uh, every gear lock has different kinds of skills associated with different numbers of bones in the backup plan. So you can see here that Pickett does not have a skill associated with uh, having one bone in their backup plan, because these bones fill in from left to right. But if he can get two bones and he spends those two bones, he spends this one and this one, he can perform a shield bash skill. 
Uh, and I, I'm sure we're going to be using that at one time or another during this uh, game, this solo game. If he gets three bones and spends all three of the bones, he'll get a do-over where he can re-roll any number of the dice he just rolled. He can re-roll uh, one or more of them once. Uh, if he spends four bones, he'll uh, heal for two HP, and he also gets a two defense die. And then if he uh, uh, accumulates five bones and spends all five, he can do what's called a shield shock, which is sort of like an enhanced shield bash. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll ever have an opportunity to, to uh, see that, but uh, if you get the game or you, or, you, or you download the program and play it on your PC, you can experiment to your heart's content. Every gear lock comes with an innate skill, an innate special ability. So Pickett's special ability is called Shield Wall. You're going to see how that works uh, when we get into our first battle. But if we get all five of these backup plan spots filled with bones and we roll another bone and add it to our backup plan, so now we have six bones in the backup plan, then all those bones clear out automatically and the gear lock is uh, upgraded to their innate plus one capability, which for Pickett is called gear lock wall. Uh, an enhanced abil an enhanced version of shield wall. And while I'm over here, I'll point out that Pickett is a melee gear lock, so he attacks his uh, opposing units that are adjacent to him, orthogonally adjacent. Okay, so we uh, all that just to explain this one uh, this one training point. Well, now we are we, we we can get a second training point. Uh, because of the encounter, I can always click this button to see the encounter card again. Uh, so we get one more training point. I'm either going to go with shield form, uh, and again, I can control left click here, even though I haven't selected the, the skill yet. And we can see this is what I'm aiming to get for shield form called constant defense. Reduces by one any non-true damage. I'll explain that when the time comes. Dealt to Picket. So if Picket gets hit by with two damage, he only really gets hit by one because his if he had constant defense in a lock slot. Uh, so I can either go that route or I can go with Sword Advance, which is a more assertive skill. Uh, this has constant damage increased by one any damage that Picket applies to his target. Well, I'm going to go ahead and enable Sword Advance, and now I'm, I basically met the uh, 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 met uh, the rewards, if you will, of this particular encounter, except for getting this progress point. So I'm going to record that right now by right-clicking this box. So now we have one progress point, We're one progress point closer to being able to, to fight Molmesh. Before we move into the next encounter or the next day, we get to perform what's called a recovery phase. The recovery phase is this area of the, um, of the, of the program screen. Um, and in, during the, repub, uh, the recovery phase, gear locks can trade loot among themselves. Uh, of course, this is a solo game with one gear lock, so trading loot among himself is not too much fun for Pickett. Uh, you can perform a lockpicking attempt. Lockpicking attempts come in handy when you get trove loot, which is a really special kind of loot that uh, that are locked, that have three locks on them that you have to open, um, and you open them by making lockpicking attempts. So uh, we'll see how that works, hopefully, at one point or another during this game. And then after all that, every gear lock may do one of the following. So the, this is where we are right now, because we can't trade, and we have no trove loot to make a lockpicking attempt on. So we can either restore to full health, and of course we're already at full health, so we're not making that choice. We can search for better loot by discarding a loot, rolling six of hex dice, and draw a loot card for each one, blah, blah, blah. But we don't have any loot to discard. Uh, it's, it's early in the game, so we can't make this choice either. So the only choice we can make is this one, scout the area by looking ahead through the, uh, through the into a clearing, see what baddies are out there, and maybe we can frighten one of them away uh, if we don't particularly like, like him, um, that we think he's too mean for our taste. So uh, in order to scout, we roll a d6. If the result is one to three, we can re reveal a one-point baddie. So there are three different types of baddies in the game. One-point baddies being the easiest, five-point baddies being the uh, medium baddies, and 20-point baddies, uh, which are the nastiest of all. I don't think uh, in this, in this uh, 
solo game, um, we're going to see any 20-point baddies. Um, so uh, you can see with the, the choice we get is to keep the baddie on top of the stack or move it to the bottom of the stack if we think it's a little too nasty. So let's go ahead and click the Scout button to Scout. The D6 gets rolled. We got a 4. So on a 4 or 5, you can Scout a 1-point or a 5-point baddie. Um, and our first battle is going to only involve one point baddies, um, and you'll see why soon enough. So I'm not going to worry about scouting for a five point baddie right now. I'm just going to scout for a one point baddie and see what we, what we see ahead of us in the clearing uh, after doing some reconnaissance. So we see a griffin yearling. A griffin yearling uh, comes on board with two health. Of course, in our game today, only one health because of our minus one offset. And you can see that the offsets are down here at the bottom of the screen. You can change them if you want over the course of the game. You can turn them off by unchecking this box. Maybe you think that the early part of the game is easier, which it is, um, and the later part of the game gets tougher. So uh, if you're, again, if you're new to the game, you can turn these on and change them over the course of the game, whatever the case may be. Uh, so uh, this Griffin Yearling is going to have one health. It's going to be pretty easy to take out. His initiative is five. The initiative indicates where in the turn order he's going to be during the battle. Higher meaning uh, closer to the front of the turn order, uh, and lower meaning the back of the turn order, uh, the bottom of the meter. So five means he's going to he's going to be uh, pretty near pretty much near the top. He rolls two attack dice, but again because of the offset, he's only going to roll one attack die. He's a melee fatty. If we were playing with multiple gear locks. This means that if he has a choice between different gear locks to go after, uh, because they're equally close to him, for example, he will go after the weakest, the one who has the least amount of health. And this, of course, just indicates that he's a beast-type fatty. So uh, he has the flight skill. That means, for all intents and purposes, that we can only target him. We can only attack him uh, every other turn. He's going to be a piece of cake. So we don't want to move him to the bottom of the batty stack. I'm going to click no. So we're ready to move on to day two. Draw, so we're going to draw the next encounter. Yes, we want to advance the day counter. This one called hardly out the gate. Feel free to pause and read the text if you'd like to. Uh, okay, I'm going to right click and flip the card over. And now we have a battle. So uh, this, uh, that's what this icon means. We have two choices. We can hail the guards for help in which case we are going to face uh, batty points worth of baddies. Now, what are batty points? Well, you'll find out very shortly. But at the start of each round, arrows from the wall, which is described on the other side of the card, deal one true damage to each batty. True damage is damage that you take, that you can't prevent, um, uh, or very rarely prevent. So... Uh, th that would be a big help, of course, if we could deal one true damage to every batty. But uh, if we went with that choice, we don't get any extra freebies here. You can see the circle is empty. But if we go with this choice, which basically is the same thing except we don't get this benefit, we get a, a training point. And regardless of whatever choice we make, we're still going to get a training point, a loot for every member of the party. There's only us, so a loot for us, and a progress point. And I can tell you right now that I have never failed uh, this um, this choice, uh, even when I was new to the game. It's not very difficult, especially when you're playing a solo encounter uh, with one gear lock. So I think that's the choice we're going to make. We're going to have a battle with batty points, and uh, we're not going to get any benefit. And if we succeed, we're going to get two training points, a loot, and a progress point. So what are batty points? Well, batty points are calculated by taking the number of days and multiplying it times the number of gear locks. So we're on day two with one gear lock. Two times one is two. And that's why this box over here says two points, two batty points. So when we set up this battle mat uh, with, uh, with the default value here, it's going to use two one-point baddies. And remember, we know the Griffin Yearling is going to be the first one. He's going to come out in lane one. And we know he's melee. So melee baddies show up in this row here. So the, so the Griffin Yearling is going to come up here. The second baddie that comes on, we don't know anything about him uh, or her, but uh, if it's melee, it's going to show up here. If it's range, it's going to show up here. 
if we were fighting additional baddies, the next one would come in lane three, the next one would come in lane four. And you can see each lane is indicated by a specific color. Uh, anyway, we're going to face two baddies right now. I'm going to click up, click on set up battle mat, and we're going to get started with our first battle. So the first thing that happens is that we roll our initiative die. Remember, every baddie has their initiative spe uh, specified on their baddie chip, but uh, every gear lock has his own um, uh, initiative die. And Pickett's initiative die looks like this. So one die face has a five on it, three die faces have a three, uh, and two die faces have a two. So for the most part, he usually is pretty low or in the middle of the pack on the uh, initiative meter. But we got lucky here in our first battle, we got a five. So where do we want to put Pickett? Do we pick it? Do we want to have him face this melee griffin yearling? We have another melee baddie over here, a bog frog with poison two, who doesn't roll any uh, dice, attack dice, but he does poison us. Uh, and as you can see, he has four health, although with our offset, only three health uh, is indicated in this box. Uh, he's down here at the bottom of the initiative meter. I think I'm going to devote my attention to him. So I'm going to put pick it right here so right off the bat he's going to be face off against the bog frog. Uh, uh, this game is all about positional play. This is a very tight bat battle map when you have lots of different baddies and lots of different gear locks in, in some cases. Where you position everybody and then how you move them around is really a big part of this game. So uh, for now this is a pretty easy decision for me to make. I'm going to put pick it right there. At the start of battle, Pickett may roll on the, all of his yellow defense dice and place rolled shields in the active slots. Okay, so what's all that about? Uh, well, this is Pickett's innate skill, his shield wall ability. Remember down here, his innate skill is shield wall. If I left click on this icon, I'm going to get one defense die. If I right click on it, I get two defense dice. So I'm going to right click, get any shields, we can put them in active slots up here. So we, oh, okay, we got a double shield, a single and a single. So I can either drag these up into an active slot. That's sort of the intuitive way to do it, but there's usually a shortcut uh, to avoid having to drag. And with uh, defense dice in, in the roll area down here, that is to control shift click. So I can control shift click and control shift click. And now I've moved both of those defense dice into active slots. So the first two hits, against Pickett are going to bounce off those shields and exhaust those dice. Uh, these dice, however, count against the defense staff. So because we have two defense dice up here, Pickett will not be able to roll defense dice when his turn comes up in battle. The most important thing about battles, for, as far as the program is concerned, is the, it's, a, it's vital that the program knows whose turn it is. And uh, I indicate the turn by clicking on the appropriate uh, initiative die. So if I click on Picket, the program now knows it's Picket's turn. Before we do roll dice, we have to choose a target. And of course, the only target we can choose is the Bog Frog, because the Bog Frog is the only baddie who is adjacent to us right now. Diagonal does not count. Our dexterity is three, so we can choose three dice. Well, this is going to be a pretty easy decision, because we know we can't roll defense dice. Those are already uh, used up here in active slots. We can roll one attack die, that's allowed by our stat here, and uh, for, the other two for the other two dexterity, I'm going to use these two skill dice that we picked up early, and hopefully we'll get some good results. We can get these into lock slots and get their benefits. Now I can, again, can click and drag these down here, or I can just double click and double click. And now those skills uh, are down here in the roll area, and now we're ready to go. Okay, well, this was our uh, stand ground. We wanted to get constant regen. Instead, we got a reusable bone. The question is, should I put it in, a, um, in the backup plan, or should I hold on to it and, and just get it back onto the mat so I can roll it again next turn? Uh, I think I'm going to do that. So I can simply just click and drag this up here, and in which case it's going to go back to its home spot on the, um, on the player map. 
but we did get a nice result here. We got constant damage of plus one. So that means that right off the bat, Pickett gets plus one hits uh, in this attack against the bog frog. Let me get this into a lock slot. So we get plus one, plus one. So two hits against the bog frog. Too bad, it would have been nice to take him out right here and now, but uh, that's all right. We severely weakened him. We should be able to take care of him uh, in the next turn. Uh, and now Pickett's turn is done. It's now the Griffin Yearling's turn. And the message says the Griffin Yearling will move two spaces orthogonally toward Pickett, and then it will roll to attack him if adjacent. So the Griffin Yearling needs to get adjacent to Pickett. Well, the easiest way to do that is to come down here. And now he's ready to attack. He, he rolls normally with two attack dice, but because of the offset, he's only rolling one. And uh, we got one hit against us. And if this is the first time the Griffin Yearling has attacked, he takes flight and will be untargetable. Remember I said he flies on every other turn. So we indicate that by putting a flight effect die on his, his chip. So he got uh, one hit against us. So we've used up one shield. It is the bog frog's turn. The bog frog attacks Pickett. Doesn't have any dice to roll, but he does apply poison two. So we take this poison two effect die and we put it, drag it up here to Pickett's chip. I click on the round die up here and we go into round two and Pickett automatically gets highlighted. And you can see if this is the start of Pickett's turn, well it is, deal two true damage due to poison and then reduce the poison by one. True damage ignores shields and things like that. We're going to tell the program that by control left clicking to apply true damage. So one, two, and now we reduce the poison by one. So now we want to take out this bog frog. Because I have constant damage, I'm automatically going to get one hit against him. I can roll one defense die because I have only one in an active slot right now. Uh, and I can roll up to two. And if I wanted to, I could get rid of this, remove it from the active slot, and roll two uh, dice if I just wanted to see if I could get a better result. But I'm going to leave that one up there. I'll add one more here, and I will bring Stan Ground back again and, and see if we can get a better, a better uh, uh, roll this time. So now I'm going to roll these three dice for our three dexterity. Okay, again, we got a reusable bone, not what I wanted. Uh, so I'm going to just, again, I'm just going to put it back on the battle mat. I don't care. Uh, we got another shield. That's nice. So I'll control left, uh, control shift, click that to put it in an active slot. We got two damage, but we get a plus one. So three damage is more than enough to take out this bog frog. He is dead meat. He is, uh, he is now going to get removed by the program removed from the battle mat and his initiative die gets removed as well. And now we are at the Griffin Yearling's turn, who is going to attack Pickett because uh, she is in position. Remember she rolls one die, she got a bone, and if this is the first time uh, that the Griffin Yearling attacked, we remove the, the flight effect die. So she has come down from flight uh, to try to attack Pickett and now she is targetable. So we go into round three. Pickett still has that poison on him, so he takes one true damage due to poison, but now the poison gets reduced to zero and is gone. We can also roll this tan ground, see if we can get into a lock slot once and for all. This is gonna be easy. We're about to take out the Griffin Yearling and win this battle. Oh my gosh, we failed across the board, but Perfect, because I can add both of these bones to the backup plan, and we could do a shield bash. So how does shield bash work? Well, the tooltip, uh, when I hover over the box, says we remove the, all the fence uh, from the active and locked slots and then apply it as damage. So by spending these two bones, and remember, this one comes back to the player mat because it's a reusable bone. It doesn't get exhausted. Normally it would. We convert these two defense dice, exhaust them, and now we can convert those into two hits against our target. And that's what we're going to use to take out the Griffin Yearling. And we have just won the battle. Yes. So we can come back to our hardly out the gate encounter card. 
and see what we get. Well, we get a progress point. I'm going to record that first. So now we've got two progress points. We get a loot and two training points. Okay, so first we're going to draw a loot, see what we get. We got a fortunate discovery. A fortunate discovery is a single-use loot that we can spend in order to select one of our consumable skill dice. This is one of the ways to get a consumable skill dice on your player map. So I'm going to go ahead and use this. I'm going to bring on uh, a gobby jerky. And we can roll this whenever we want to. And you can see that depending upon how it rolls, we can get two, three, or four healing on the spot. Now we get two training points. Um, I think for one of them, I'm going to bump up my attack stat. Uh, to two. Remember, before doing that, I have to perform a training attempt on the one die we have. So I have to roll one attack die and not get a bone. Okay, we were successful. So I'm going to give myself one uptick on the at attack stat, and now we can roll up to two attack dice and up to two defense dice, but not all four of them because remember our dexterity is, de is limited to three. Now, I could, could up my dexterity with my other training point, but I think I am going to uh, bring on shield form um, and enable that skill for my, uh, for my second training point. So now we're ready for the recovery phase. Uh, again, we don't have, uh, we don't trade, we have no trove loot. Uh, and I think we're going to restore to full health because our health is at four. Uh, so I'm going to click restore health for our recovery phase this time around. That brings us back up to seven. We're ready to move on. So for, I'm about to draw my third and last special starting encounter. Yes, advance the day. And again, this one's called Crossing the Sibrin. And feel free to pause and read it if you'd like. All right, I'm going to flip it. We're now on day three with two progress points to our name. So there's no battle here. One choice is to roll a D6 for each party member. And on, on a one or a two, your party is spotted. Find the first tyrant encounter and place it on top. There's a button that allows us to do that. Move tyrant encounter to top. Alternatively, we could hire the Molnor. We get a trove loot. That's what this icon means. Each member of the party gets a trove, trove loot. And then we shuffle the special encounter, Molnor Traders, into the encounter deck. Regardless of whatever choice we make, we get a progress point. Now, if we take this choice, we get two progress points and a training point. But this is a demonstration game, so we're going to hire the Molnor so we can see how trove loot works. So, uh, we have to shuffle the special encounter Molnor Traders into the encounter deck. There's a button here that says Add New Encounter. This will show me all the encounter cards in the game. There are 12 solo play encounters, and there are 30 multiplayer encounters, uh, and we need to find Molnor Traders, and there it is right there. So I'm going to double-click that. And the program just shuffled Molnor Traders into the encounter deck. So now we have eight cards in the deck, not seven. Okay, so what do we get? We get a progress point. So now we're up to three, and we get a trove loot. So let's draw a trove loot and see how those work. Okay, remember I said they had combination locks on them. Three different locks you had to crack before you could see what the card is. So we can't flip this card until we crack the lever lock, which is a five, five setting lock. Uh, then we have to, after, first we have to get the lever lock open, then we have to open the trip lock, which is a two, and then we have to open the force lock, which is a three, in that order. All right, uh, so we got our, we got our progress point, we got our trove loot, and we shuffled the molar traders into the deck. Uh, we have full health, so uh, for our recovery phase, first of all, we're going to make a lock picking attempt. So we can click this pick lock button, which will, there are four dice in the game, four lock picking dice, and you're going to see how these work right now. When I click this button, they're going to come up in the roll area down here, and they're going to roll automatically. So there are four unique dice, four unique lock picking of dice. There's one called the intuition die. And you can see that two of the faces have a re-roll ability. 
Two of the cho choices are a convert side of the die, and there's another side that's called save plus one. Again, when we get that, you'll see how that works. So aside from the intuition die, this is the lever die. So it's called the lever die because three of the faces give us a lever result, one, two, or three. Two of the faces give us a force result, and one face gives us a trip result. The, tr the uh, trip die uh, similarly has three faces with a trip result, two with a, a lever result, and one with a force result. And uh, finally, the force die has three force sides, two trip sides, and one lever side. Remember, for this first lock, we need to get five lever. We got two lever, and we got a convert, which, is a, which allows us to change the letter on any one of the dice, any one of the action lock picking dice. Well, that's perfect, because we can change the 3T into a 3L, and the 3L plus the 2L makes 5L, and that allows us to uh, crack that first lock. So I can control click, and now the first lock has been opened. Now when you use dice to open a lock, you have to exhaust them, so these two go away. And uh, we can get to continue to try to uh, open the trip lock. And this is our lever die, so as you can see, uh, well, we have one chance out of six, but depending upon what the result is of this uh, intuition die, we, we may or may not be able to accomplish our task here. But let's go ahead and roll and see what happens. Okay, that's not a good result. We got one lever. We could change it to one trip, but one trip is in two trip, so we failed, and we have to stop working on the lock. All right, so we're done with lock picking, and now we get to do the final step of the recovery phase, uh, which is going to be a scout the area for us. So we're going to scout again. We got a six, which allows us to scout one five or twenty point batty. I will scout a one point batty. We got a bog pole, which is a lesser version of a bog frog. He poisons one, has a little bit less health, uh, and is ranged uh, as opposed to uh, melee. I'm not going to move to the bottom of the stack. Uh, that's the end of the recovery phase. We're ready to draw our next encounter. So this is day four. We're past the special encounters now. Now we're going to see the real thing. We're advancing to day four. A trap of my own making. Go ahead and read the story if you'd like. Okay, I'm going to flip the card. And okay, we've got two choices. First of all, the battle queue is not going to be batty points. It's going to be two five-point batties, period. And in choice number one, as baddies enter the battle map, roll a d6 for each. On a one to a two, the trap does nothing. On a three to a six, the baddie is stunned for the first two rounds, which means that baddie misses its first two turns. Alternatively, uh, we, the battle, the battle queue can be two five-point baddies. You have surprise, which means that uh, after the initiative meter gets figured out, all the bat because we have surprise, all the baddies move to the bottom of the initiative meter, and baddies take one true damage any time they move to a new position on the battle map, including their initial position. Okay, so do we want to get a, a a four out of six chance of the, each baddie getting stunned, or do we want them to take true damage? And with us having surprise. Uh, I think I'm going to go with this choice. So baddies take one true damage anytime they move, including their initial position. This is the way we're going to go. So we have surprise, and uh, the baddies right off the bat are going to get hit with one true damage. With our offset, of course, that's going to be a nice little benefit. Uh, we don't get any uh, anything special depending upon the choice, but if we're successful at this battle, we get two training points, a loot, and a progress point. Okay. We reduce the points to zero by control shift clicking. And we spawn two five point baddies. So this is the battle queue up here. When you do, even when you do a normal uh, setup battle map with points, 
what's happening very quickly is that the program is putting baddies into the battle queue and then bringing them onto the battle mat. And so you don't even see them populate the battle queue. But they go in there and they come out real quickly. In this case, we're not going to have any batty points. We're just going to have two five-point baddies come on. And now I'm kind of sorry I didn't go ahead and at least uh, scout one of those five-point baddies when, the, when I had the opportunity. All right, let's go ahead and uh, set those up and see what we get. Okay, well, we got another five. That puts us in second place because we're facing a ranged baddie here on the back row, a dragon delinquent who has the engulf skill, and if he rolls a bone, you can see he normally rolls two attack dice and two defense dice, uh, but with our offsets, he's only going to roll one and one. But if any either of those is a bone, he also gets the weaken two ability, and you'll see how that works soon enough. Because he's ranged, he goes in the back row, and he does not have to move to attack. He can attack any gear lock on the battle mat. He also has the engulf skill. You, well, I'll show you how that works when the time comes. The other baddie is a stone golem, a pretty nasty one, who is going to roll two attack dice and one defense die with our offset. He has the break skill. The engulf skill means that if the dragon delinquent hits us for any damage, not only do we get hit with the damage, but any other, th any other units, be they friendly or not, get hit by the damage as well. So that means if I place myself here where I'm adjacent to the stone golem, I could have any damage dealt by the dragon delinquent help take out the stone golem. Uh, and the fact that I have constant damage will help too. The, the thing with his break skill is that uh, if, I use, if I roll normal attack dice against him, they get exhausted after one roll. So if I went ahead and rolled both attack dice, I could never roll those two attack dice again. So I think I'm going to have to count on the dragon delinquent to help take out the stone golem. And to do that, I'm going to position a picket right here. Now the skill from our constant damage doesn't get broken because of the break skill. The break skill doesn't affect that. Okay, uh, now we get to do our, uh, our shield wall. So we roll two defense dice. Our defense stat is still two. So let's see what we get. Well, again, we got a one and a one. So we'll put those in active slots. And now we click on the first unit in the initiative meter, which is the dragon delinquent, who is going to roll against us, of course. And he's going to roll one attack die and one defense die. And remember, any damage he does to us will be also be dealt against the stone golem. So let's, for, for once here, I'm going to hope for some damage. Because any damage he deals to us is going to bounce off our shields. Okay, well, he got, oh, shoot. He has the weakened skill because of the bone, the bone got rolled. Remember, weakened skill is tied to a bone being rolled, and it's weakened too. What does that mean? Well, it means, and by the way, when a baddie is selected, their skills show up here at the top of the battle map. So I can hover over weakened and see that it means the target must reduce his dexterity by the number shown on their next turn. Place a weakened effect die on the, tar on the target. So because... The Dragon Delinquent has Weakened 2. We put a Weakened 2 die on uh, on Picket, and that means when it's Picket's turn, he's going to lose two of his three dexterity. Anyway, we got one hit against us. Uh, that's going to bounce off of our one of our shields, so I'm going to exhaust one of these. Uh, but because of the Engulf skill, and remember, we saw a message probably, yeah, reminding us that the Dragon Delinquent has both the Engulf skill and the Weakened skill because he rolled a bone. Uh, so that uh, one hit goes against the uh, Stone Golem as well. Now, we get a message reminding us about the Break skill, but he doesn't, the program doesn't know where the damage is coming from, so we can ignore that. It's coming from the, oh, oh, okay. Well, because the Dragon Delinquent actually caused the, uh, triggered the um, damage against the stone golem, 
the br the break skill is going to break one of the uh, stone of the dragon delinquent dice. And the way I I specify that is by double clicking on his chip, and then I can left click in this box, and that basically now means he, one of his attack dice are broken. Okay, it's our turn. So our dexterity has been reduced from three to one, as you can see over here. Dex is now one. And if I had to adjust that, I could adjust this by right-clicking or left-clicking that box. I get rid of the weakened die. So now we have we can only roll one die against the stone golem. But I'm going to see if I can get either one of these skills to finally trigger. Um, question is which one? Let's go with stand ground again. Uh, we got so many bones last time. It's high time we got uh, this to come up to the face we want. So that's the one die I'm going to roll. Let's see what we get. Come on. Ugh. All right. Well, this time I think I will add it to the backup plan. So uh, we will get it back eventually. But it's in there for now until I expend it by using one of my backup skills. So we got no result out of that roll. Oh, no, we got win, one, we get one hit because of our skill die. So... Um, because of our constant damage. So we do get a hit against the Stone Golem. Uh, reminding us about the break skill. That does not affect our skill, however. It only affects normal attack dice. Now it's the Stone Golem's turn to come after us with two attack dice and one defense die. Remember, three and two offset to two and one. So we got two damage and one defense. His defense shows up in this box, so he has one defensive die. It works the same way as our defensive dice work. He got two hits against us, one of which is going to bounce off this shield, so I can exhaust that. But we have to take the other damage, so now we're down to six. And we're going into round two. Dragon Delinquent's going to roll its other non-broken die. And it's going to roll its defense die, which was a bone the last time. So it gets to roll if it's not on its chip, um, in which case it wouldn't be able to roll it, for the same reason we wouldn't be able to roll if, we, uh, our, if our defense dice were tied up. And it gets two defense and one hit. Okay, so it got two on, def on a single defensive die, got one hit against us. I wish it was a two. So that's one damage against us and one damage against the Stone Golem who has that defensive die. So as soon as I left click his health, it takes it off the defense instead. Uh, so not the result I was hoping for. Maybe I should uh, roll some attack dice. Well, at least he, uh, at least the Dragon Delinquent didn't roll any bones. So it didn't get hit us for weaken. It only, so that message should have just said, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing so much talking here, I'm not reading the messages. So the, only the engulf skill triggered in that case. And now it is Pickett's turn. That was just the attack of the uh, dragon delinquent. So now it's Pickett's turn. You know what, maybe I'll roll some defense here. I think I'm going to just go for defense. So I'm going to roll two defensive dice. One of them are in active slots right now, and, uh, and we'll see if we can get shield form to come up. And if not, if we get a bone, maybe we can use uh, our shield bash ability, because we will have two bones then, at least. And But of course we have to get some defensive dice to come up. Okay, well this is great. I got a one and a two, which goes into active slots. I got another bone. So I'll go ahead and add that to the backup plan. Now I have two, both of which are reusable bones, so they'll come right back to my, my player mat. I can exhaust, spend both of these to perform a shield bash. And as you recall, the, the way that works is I exhaust these two dice and convert them into damage. So that's two damage, three damage, plus my constant damage makes it four damage which is more than enough to take out the stone golem, and nothing gets broken, because, again, those were not normal, defense, uh, normal attack dice. So one, two, three, four, and the stone golem is history. 
That was a very nice uh, turn of events. Okay, that's great. We are going into round three. But now, uh, the Dragon Delinquent's just going to pick on us, and only us, unless we can maneuver. Our, well, we're going to have to maneuver ourselves to get adjacent, up, uh, adjacent to the Dragon Delinquent. So it still has its attack die. It didn't get... No, uh, it should have broken that. Uh, um, the, that was my mistake. Even though um, the, the Stone Golem had defense, that break skill still triggers. So now this becomes minus two, and the Dragon Delinquent does not roll any dice against us. And because its single defense die is tied up, it doesn't get to roll that. So it, it's rolling nothing. So now it's our turn. Uh, obviously, we need to move two spaces, one, two, to get adjacent to the uh, Dragon Delinquent. So our dex is now down to one. I know I'm going to get one hit, but that's just going to come off the Dragon Delinquent shields. Let's try shield form. Okay, we got that one to trigger. That's great. Okay, and we got what we wanted, constant defense. So that goes into a lock slot, and now anytime we get hit with damage, the first unit of damage bounces off automatically. Going into round four. Again, the Dragon Delinquent doesn't roll any dice. Oh, except, hold on, hold on. Uh, our turn, we get one automatic damage from constant damage. Uh, so I should have taken one hit against the Dragon Delinquent. It still isn't rolling any dice because its defensive die, its sole defensive die is tied up, and its two attack dice are still broken for the remainder of the battle. So uh, this is really a piece of cake, isn't it? Our turn, uh, we have our full dexterity. I guess I'll go ahead and roll both of my attack dice, and I will roll stand ground. Okay, finally we got stand ground to trigger. We've got our constant regen, which means we'll heal one at the beginning of our turn. Of course, we've already passed the beginning of our turn, so we can't use it right now. But I'll put that in a lock slot. We got three damage plus one is four damage against the dragon delinquent. One, two, three, four. You saw that the first one came off its defense. The next three came off its health. We're going into round five. The only thing the Dragon Delinquent can roll now is its single defense die, because now it's no longer on its chip. So it's going to go ahead and roll that defense die. And it got a bone, so therefore its weakened skill triggered. That's too bad. So I put a weakened two back on Picket, and now we only have one dex. So I can only roll one die. But we get to heal thanks to constant regen. So I bring my health up to six. I get rid of this. We don't need it anymore because uh, our dex has been recorded. It's now down to one. So I can roll one die. We'll roll one attack die. So I got a bone, which I'll add to the backup plan. But I do get one damage automatically, So, and he does not have his defense because he rolled a bone on his turn, so he's down to two. Going into round six. Now, round six is uh, the start of round six are the fatigue rounds. Round six and on means that every unit that's still on the battle mat takes one damage that can't be blocked for any reason. So I click on this die. We're now in round six. Due to fatigue, each unit takes loses one HP. And now the Dragon Delinquent, it's his turn, but he loses one, and I lose one. Okay, uh, top of round six, Dragon Delinquent's turn. Again, it rolls that one defense die. Got one this time. Uh, this time it didn't get a bone, so we're not weakened. We're going to be able to take it out very easily now that it's our turn. Uh, I get to heal myself, so I come back up to six. I guess I'm just going to take him out. So uh, I'm not weakened. I can roll two attack dice and a defense die. I uh, don't really think I need a defense die, but let's go ahead. More than I needed to take the guy out. One off of defense. One, he's down to zero. Defeated. 
end of end of the battle. Let's go back to a trap of my own making. See what we get. We get a progress point, so we're up to four now. We get a loot and two training points. So let's take our loot. I got last battle stew. Uh, use until depleted. Place seven HP on this card. At the start of each new day, remove one HP for spoilage. Outside of battle, any gear lock may remove any number of HP from, from the stew to heal for that amount. Okay, that's great. What I can do is record 7 HP in one of these miscellaneous generic counters I have up here in the top left corner. So I'm just going to put a 7 in this box. And now, uh, I guess one's going to come off when I go into the next encounter, so I might as well record that right now. So it's really going to be six once we draw another encounter because of spoilage. But I, I'm, at, I'm at six health. I can spend one of those to bring myself up to full health. So I'll spend one, uh, one of the stew and bump myself up to seven. Now I'm at full health and I'll be able to do a scout. But before I do a scout, oh, I got to get the skills. Uh, so I get two training points. I think I'm going to go into the ward profession because the more of these dice you uh, you bring onto your player mat, the better the skill is. And the skill I'm most interested in is repost. So I'm going to pick repost and situational awareness. If I show you the six sides of repost, you can see that two of them are switch, which means that I switch positions with a a batty or a gear lock. Well, there's no other gear lock, so I would switch positions with a batty on the player mat. That does me no good. But this uh, is um, rush, which means if I get this, I can anytime during his turn, if you look at the top of the screen, pick it may move up to three spaces anytime during his turn. The way movement works in, uh, if it's not, if I haven't, I haven't really made it clear, but normally gear locks move and then attack. They don't get to move after their attack, but this skill would allow me to do that if I wanted to make use of it. What I really am interested in was, is getting repost, which means when Pickett is attacked by an adjacent enemy unit, Pickett may avoid all the attack and effect damage. And if used in conjunction with another repost die face in an active slot, Pickett may also deal three damage to the attacking enemy. So that what I'm really hoping for and situational awareness the same three die faces but two of them are of each type this one focuses mostly on repost so if I can get a repost result on both of these dice I can avoid an attack from a baddie and also deal three damage automatically at which point I then have to exhaust both dice I get to do another lock picking attempt on our trip lock and force lock so let me go ahead and do that okay we need two trip and I got no trip results and a save plus one which does not allow me to change the letter on any one of these but the nice thing about lock picking is that if you completely fail on your first lock picking attempt of the turn you get a free second turn so I get to roll the dice again. And I got a re-roll with one trip. Okay, so I'm going to hold that. And which one do I want to roll, re-roll? Well, I'm going to want to re-roll this one uh, because this has the most, most of the trip results on it. So I, although this has most of the force results on it, Hmm, I guess I have to go for the lock. Um, so I am going to hold this. I get to re-roll this die again. This always rolls. And now I'm re-rolling this die, hoping for another trip result. Didn't get it, but I got another re-roll. So I could, once again, re-roll both of those dice. Great. I got a 3T. So I can use this. Okay, so I, and I got to save plus one. The way save plus one works is you get to bump up one of your 
action number, one of the numbers on one of your uh, lock picking dice by one, I increase the number and I get to save the die. I don't have to exhaust it if I use it toward opening the lock. So I basically use this effect to turn the one T into two T, which opens up this lock. Now I'm two locks down, one lock to go, and I don't have to exhaust the die because I got to save it. So now I get to unlock all these, reroll all of them toward trying to get the three force that I need to finally open this. And there it is. There's my three force. Didn't need anything else. So I open the lock. It is a shock inducer, a backup plan extension. I can spend one bone. It's like it adds another a, a skill to my backup plan. And I can spend one bone to increase the initi my initiative by one spot on the initiative meter. Okay. And that's a permanent card. Uh, so I'll never lose that. Very nice. All right, uh, time to scout because we're at full health. Okay, we got a three. So uh, that means that we have to scout a one point batty. We got a cobalt tracker who is hardy and compound. With our offset of one, he'll only have one health. Hardy means that no matter how much damage we deal uh, to him, he is going to only take one damage. Compound means he rolls a number of attack dice equal to what round it is. So one attack die in round one, two in round two, but it'll only be one because in round two because of the offset and so forth. So uh, I'll, he's going to be easy. I'll leave him on top of the stack. So we still have our bog pole on the top of the stack and the cobalt tracker right below that. Now we're moving into... Day five, a dire situation. Feel free to go ahead and read. And now I'm going to flip the card. So we have two choices, uh, neither of which affects our rewards. If we're successful, we're going to get a loot, two training points, and a progress point. The battle queue is not batty points. It's a one point and a five point wolf. In both cases, in this choice, cannot use skill dice the first two rounds of battle. In this choice, can only use skill dice the first two rounds of battle. Okay, so this is going to have to uh, call on my memory skills to remember this, uh, especially since I'm talking. My memory is pretty bad as it is, and I'm talking, so that's going to make my memory even worse. I hope I can remember. I am going to go with, uh, well, we've got a five-point wolf. Uh, wolves tend to have lash back, uh, which means that when they hit us, when we hit them, they hit us back. Uh, so I think I'm going to go with this choice. Can only use skill dice the first two rounds of battle. So the key is I got to remember that. Can only use skill dice the first two rounds of battle. I apologize in advance if I screw that up. I may forget, but I'll try to remember. Uh, you know what? I got a little note feature. I can leave a note to myself. Can only can only use skill dice the first two rounds of battle. All right, uh, we need a one point and a five point wolf, which means we're going to have to view the batty stacks, which means that we're not using batty points, so I'm going to reduce this to zero. And I'm going to go into view batty stacks to view the one point batty stack. So these are neither of these are a wolf. So we're looking for the first wolf. This is the top of the deck. We're looking down, we're looking down. We've got a dire wolf pup. We're going to move that to the top of the stack. And now we're going to view the five point baddies. Uh, we got a dire wolf, which will move to the top of the stack. Okay, when I hit the close button, these won't get reshuffled, but these will. Now I need to spawn a one point and a five point baddie. I'm assuming in that order. Normally, when you do baddie points, the higher point baddies come out first and they get followed by the lower point baddies but I'm going to read the, interpret this card literally. 
So one point before five point, ready to go. Set up battle map. And there, of course, is the dire wolf pup. Here's the dire wolf. What did I roll initiative wise? I got a two, so that's, that's I'm not surprised. I'm at the bottom of the stack now, the bottom of the initiative meter. So where do I want to put Pickett? He ha this guy has lashed back one, so if I hit him, he hits me back for one. He only rolls one attack die, and will only have two health thanks to my offset. This guy is a, just a, basically a mere version. Uh, he rolls three attack dice with the offset, and he has lash back two. I guess I'm going after him first, so I'll put Pickett here. So I'm going to roll these two defense. I would have been able to do this in either case. I got two ones again, so they both go into active slots. Now we go uh, to Purple's turn. So Direwolf gets to go first, rolling three dice against us. Three hits, one of which is going to bounce off our constant defense. So uh, one, two, oh, I have active shields. So one is bounces off this. One bounces off this, one bounces off that. So no damage from the Dire Wolf. Dire Wolf Pup's turn move, has to move. So he's going to come down here and uh, roll to attack us with one die. One damage bounces off our shield. So no damage. Our turn. I am going to go after the dire wolf first, so I can roll three dice, and I'm going to roll, should I roll these skills, and hope to get double repost, or that's going to be unlikely, isn't it, uh, should I, or should I roll defense? I, I, I have one. You know what? I'll use one, one, and one, and see what I line up here. Going against the dire wolf. Okay, so I get I got one defense. I got a repost. I'm going to just put this in an active slot. You can see there's an A in parentheses up there in the skill tip. So that's going up there. I got one damage plus one. So I hit him for two. He hits me back for two. One, two. He hits me back for two. One comes off constant defense. One comes off this defense. So again, I don't take any real damage. And now we're going into round two. Dire Wolf will roll against us. Well, again, rolling three attack dice. We got two hits. One bounces off the shield, so one damage against us. So the first one bounces off the shield, the second one hits us for one damage. Dire Wolf Pup's turn. One die. Got one hit, uh, bounces off the shield, no effect. Our turn. And constant regen allows us to heal up back to seven. And again, we're going to target this dire wolf. And I will roll, uh, I guess I'll roll one of each and bring this one on. So I got one shield. I got a rush. Do I want to use that? So that allows me to move up to three spaces at no dexterity cost. I could use that to retreat and avoid this guy. But I don't really need to. Um, I got plenty of health. I got gobby jerky if I need it. I am just going to move this back onto my player map. And, oh, and I've got two damage plus one equals three damage. 
So uh, one, two, three, he's gone. So he doesn't get a slash back because we defeated him. Uh, one guy down, one to go, the easier one to go. So we're going into round three. And now I can't use skill dice. Uh, I remembered. Okay, round three. Can't use skill dice. The dire wolf will roll to attack. Pick it. So we got one damage. I can't use skill dice. So, oh, okay. So um, I have to take that. But I do have active shield, so I can't. But it does bounce off my shield. So I can't use this shield, but I can use this shield. Uh, this is not considered a skill die. This is just a normal defensive die. So I don't take any damage. Uh, my turn, uh, I guess I'm just going to roll two attack dice and then one defense die and get rid of this guy. Okay, and I got two hits plus, I can't, not plus one, two hits is enough to take this guy out. So he's dead. Let me clear my note. I don't need it anymore. This guy is defeated, and the battle is over. All right, that was uh, a trivial undertaking. Of course, this comes out of the active slot now because it's an active slot, not a lock slot. Only these three stay. Okay, uh, so what do we get? We were successful. We get two training points, a loot, and a progress point. So a progress point, uh, a loot... We got mixed berries, one single use, heal yourself for three in battle or five out of battle, so more healing. We're at full health, we don't need healing. Uh, we're going to uh, this is going to spoil again on the next encounter, so I'm going to uh, do it uh, now before I forget. So we lose one due to spoilage. And uh, now we get two training points, so I think I'm just going to bring on these guys okay so now we've got the entire warden profession more chances to get repost dice and uh, okay and now we don't have to do lock picking we just have to scout because we're at full health so we're scouting one five or twenty point batty on a six uh, we're going into day six, which, if it's batty points, will be six points, a five and a one. So I will, have I scattered a five? No, I haven't. I've scattered two ones. So I'll scout a five. It's a cobalt elite. Hardy only takes one point of damage, no matter how much damage, and he's compound. Meaning he rolls based on the round number. I don't know. Let's move him to the bottom. I'm going to move him to the bottom. Okay. Uh, I just don't want to be annoyed by him. All right. We're uh, moving into drawing another encounter. Day six. I've already recorded the spoilage. Just out of reach. So we haven't encountered, we haven't gotten that tyrant encounter yet. It's, some, it's still somewhere in the deck. Nor have we gotten more and more traitors. That's still buried in the deck, the five cards that are remaining. Uh, so you can read this if you'd like. Now I'll flip. So we have both, uh, we have a battle. One, the first choice gives us a progress point and a training point. This one doesn't give us a progress point, but it does give us a training point. And regardless, if we're successful, we get a loot and a training point. What is the open air? Battle queue with batty points. Add two batty points to the battle queue. Any range batty start at the top of the initiative meter. Otherwise, battle queue with batty points. Add two batty points to the battle queue. You have surprise and batties cannot move during the first round. So I will just go with the first choice. Okay, so we're bumping up the battle queue by two batty points. So we're facing a five point and three one point baddies. No other effects except for all range baddies have to make, we have to make sure they start at the top of the initiative meter. Let's go ahead and set up. We rolled a three. That's going to put us near the bottom. 
So these guys, so this guy's already on top. Yellow, yellow lane is already on the top. Uh, this guy is ranged. He's down here. We need to drag his initiative die with a shift key up to there. So now we've moved him, these two guys, to the top of the initiative meter. And um, now where do I want to put Pickett? So this guy is hardy and compound. He only has one health. This guy's going to signal another one point batty. But he's going to take flight. So, and he's ahead of me. So he's not going to be targetable. Bogpole will um, attack with poison. And a griffin yearling, he'll also take flight before I can get to him. So there's no point in positioning myself here because I'm not going to be able to attack. So I might as well go after this guy. So I will put myself here. Plan to go after this guy. Okay, I get to roll my two defensive dice. I got a bone. I can't use that in the backup plan because this is not in battle. This is just using my innate skill. So I can record the uh, one defense in an active slot. And we go to the yellow lane's turn. The cobalt tracker is rolling one die. He got one hit. Bounces off our sh uh, constant defense. No effect. The bog pole doesn't it roll with dice. All he does is poison us for one. So I put a poison one on me. The Griffin Howler. He spawns a one point batty. Okay, I just spawned one. So he'll stay there until a lane frees up. And now he has to move toward me. I don't want to move this guy here because he's going to go, fl he's going to fly and I won't be able to attack him. So I. I get the choice. I can move him down here. Okay. He rolls two dice. Wow. Double twos. Okay. He flies. So he's untargetable. Uh, he deals four points of damage, three points with constant defense, two points with this. So only two points of damage against Pickett. One, two. So it's seven down to five. And now it is Green's turn. He has to move two spaces. And I have to move him here. I can't move him here because he would have, he, he's going to look for where he can get to to be able to attack me. And that's going this way. So he can't attack me yet. Therefore, he will not fly yet. And now it is my turn. Okay, it's the start of Pickett's turn. Deal one true damage to the poison, but that will get offset by the constant regen. So they wa that's a wash, and this goes away. And now I can't target him. I want to go after this Cobalt Tracker, so I will move one space. That will limit me to rolling two, uh, two dice. I'll roll two defense dice. Oops. Only two defense dice. And now roll. I got a one and a two. Very nice. Constant damage. I get one damage no matter what. So this guy's gone. And now we're going into round two. And because the lane freed up, this one point batty will now join the battle. And he automatically, uh, so it was a bog frog who would normally go into lane three melee, but it's occupied. So it will instead go into the next lane. One in five point baddies always go to the bottom of the queue once the battle has started. So he goes to the bottom of the queue no matter what. 20, uh, 20 point baddies and tyrants come to the top of the queue from the battle map from the battle queue. Anyway, round two, uh, purple, poison one on picket. 
Okay. Uh, it is the Griffin Howler's turn. He's going to move here. Use a one, two dice. Two hits. He, the fly effect die goes away. One hit bounces off this shield. Uh, one hit I'll take off of this die. So no loss of health. Green's turn. Griffin Yearling is going to roll um, one attack die. He gets a bone and he gets the flight effect die, so he is not targetable. And so no effect. Okay, uh, it is Pickett's turn. One true damage, offset by constant regen, so that's a wash, and the poison goes away. And uh, the only guy I can go after here is the Griffin Howler. This guy's not, oh, uh, this guy is melee. He's not going to be able to reach me, so he's not going to, he's, he's blocked up unless I take this guy out, which I doubt I'll do because he has four health. Um, got two defense. I think I'm going to roll. One. Should I roll two dice or two attack? Because if I can get three, I could take him out. But he still won't be able to get to me in one turn. Okay, I'm going to roll two attack dice and I'll roll my repost. Okay. So I got two plus one is three. I did get repost. So that's three damage against the... Uh, Griffin Howler. One, two, three. So he's not quite defeated. Yellow's turn. The Bog Frog will not move two spaces toward Pickett because he can't get to Pickett. he can't get to me. He's blocked. So when a batty is blocked, they don't move at all. And because he's not moving, because he's not adjacent, he doesn't poison me. We go into round three. Fog pole puts a one point poison on me. Uh, the Griffin Howler. He got uh, two damage. One bounces off here. One comes off here. And I can double click to change that into a one. Okay. All right. And now the green lane. Rolls one die. One bounces off my constant defense. The flight effect die goes away. Pickett's turn. Wash again. Doing constant regen and the poison. Uh, poison goes away. And it doesn't really... Well, I guess I want to take this guy out because he rolls more attack dice. Uh, if I take this guy out, he's going to move in. Um, so I might as well put him off for the time being. So let us roll. I don't need to roll attack dice to take him out. Constant attack is going to be sufficient. I will roll. I can only roll one defensive die unless I remove this and re-roll it. But I'll leave it. I only have one free attack. Uh, Boy, one free slot. So this gets a little tricky here. I will roll situational awareness. Well, let's, you know what? We can roll these dice and just see what we get and choose. So uh, I'm looking for another repost. So that has one. That has two. So we're going to roll this die. Numbers 10 and 14 and one defense. And we're going to have to decide what goes where. Okay, we got a switch, which I don't need. So I'm going to get rid of that. We got a rush. 
So let's see, we were targeting this guy, so he's dead from constant attack. So da constant damage rather, so he's he's gone. Let's get rid of him. This guy's not gonna be able to reach me. He's gonna come this way. So I can't use, well, I could use Rush, but I can't avoid him. I could go this way and kind of avoid him. Um, do I want to use Rush or do I want to put it back? I don't need to use it yet. I think I will put it back. I will record a bone. And I will use, uh, I might as well use my shock inducer to increase my initiative by one spot. So I'll spend a bone and move myself up one spot on the initiative leader. It's going to be yellow's turn next, regardless of the fact that I'm moving myself up here. It is now yellow's turn. Okay, uh, the bog frog moved two spaces toward me. He comes down and over. He does not poison me because not, he's not adjacent yet. So we're going in around. Four. One poison. We've seen all this before. Now it's my turn. It's a wash. This poison goes away again. And I'll roll uh, one defense and um, again I'll roll 10 and 14. Let's see what happens. Oh, I got a repost, so I'll, and I didn't get a defense, so I'll put that in an active slot. Now I can use, remember I get that benefit, if you can, if you use two reposts, you avoid an attack, and you deal three damage to the attacking enemy. And it has to be an attack from an adjacent unit, which is going to be this bog frog, when he attacks, um, yeah, when he attacks, I'm going to use repost to defend against it. So, um, Rush isn't going to help me. This guy's gone now because constant damage, he's gone. Uh, I got a bone, so I'll add that to the backup plan. Uh, Rush isn't going to help me at this point. Well, it could if I go this way over here, but no, we're, we want to use repost. So I'm going to put this back on the mat. I will spend the bone to move myself to the top of the meter. Yellow turn is going to, yellow is going to go next. So it's now yellow's turn. Okay. Um, ball crawl will move two spaces. So I will, I can move him here or here. I don't think it matters. I will move him here. So he's attacking me with two poison. I'm going to use repost. So when Pickett is attacked by an adjacent enemy unit, Pickett may avoid all attack and effect damage, including poison and weaken. And if used in conjunction with another repost die in an active slot, Pickett may deal three damage to the attacking enemy. So both of these dice get exhausted. I get three damage to this guy. He's gone. He killed himself effectively. And now it is purple's turn. Right? No, wait a minute. Uh, I just moved ahead of purple, so it's not purple's turn. It's the end of the round. It's round five. This is when you kind of have to remember what's what. I Technically, I should not have used my backup plan until the end of the round. That's when I should have moved myself to the top, uh, one space up on the meter. So I was kind of getting ahead of myself. Anyway, it's round five. And I may heal myself thanks to constant regen. So I'm at six. I don't, why did I take, did I take, I don't remember taking the damage at this point. Doesn't really matter. Okay, uh, I'm going to move two spaces. I am going to roll, uh, I can only roll one die. I'm going to roll 10, so I'm going to get rid of the, I'll get rid of this and roll 10. That rush, that doesn't really help, so I'll put that back on the mat. 
And uh, constant damage does one damage to the bog pole. And now it's the bog pole's turn, who just puts a poison one on me again. And now it is round six, and everybody loses one to the fatigue. So I go down to five. He gets defeated. And the, and the battle is over. So we were successful. So I'm, I'm now at six progress points. I have the six I need to fight Momesh. Uh, I take a loot and two training points. <clears throat> I got a Tawaran gem, which I can exchange for a trove loot during the recovery phase. So I might as well, might as well use it right now. So I'm going to discard it. Draw a trove loot. Got a 313. That should be easy. And now I've got, uh, I'll use my last battle stew and spend two of these to bring myself up to full health. One's going to get due to lost due to spoilage uh, when I move into the next day, so I'll drop it now. And now I will try and make a lock picking attempt against 313. Okay, so we got a three lever. I got a convert. So I can turn the three force on my lever die into three lever. And that will take care of the first lock. So that has to get discarded now. And I've opened the first lock. Now I need one trip. I can't use this one trip. I believe I have to roll the dice again. So I got three trip and I got a convert, which I'd rather use the convert to make this a one trip and exhaust this die. That's my trip die. Crack open the second lock. And now I've got my force die. I need three force. Let's see if I can make it happen. Okay, I got to save plus one. That does me no good. I get, that makes this two trip, which is of no use. So unfortunately, I won't be able to open this for this turn. Now I get two training points. And I should start thinking about beefing up for Momesh. So we're going into day seven. So do I want to go after Malmesh now and just get this over with? I could use my two training points to bump my health up to nine and not even worry about getting any more skills. I still have Dobby Jerky. I haven't used it yet. Um, you know what? I think that's what I'll do. I'll spend my two training points on uh, health. And now, uh, I think I'm going to go and go after Momesh, and we'll see if we can get rid of this guy. So, I'm not drawing another encounter. I am just going to manually increase the number of days. Oh, I haven't increased, I haven't done my recovery yet. So, I'm at full health. I'm going to go uh, for my recovery phase. I will scout. I will scout a five-pointer. And there's a Griffin Howler again. Um, moving to the bottom won't make a difference. Possibly. Okay, now we're going into day seven. I am going to go after Momish, so I'm going to manually increase the number of days to seven. I'm not going to draw another encounter. I'm just going to set up for the Tyrant battle. The program will do it automatically. So the way this works is... It's batty points, but a party of one ignores this, so no batty points. And basically, it's just me against Momesh, who is, um, he is a uh, melee tyrant. He has Frenzy 2, which means if all of his dice show no bones, he gets to roll his attack dice again and add them to this for total damage. So he can do double damage, sort of. And if he starts his turn at three health or fewer, he go he leaves the battle map and retreats and comes back with full health. 
So once he gets to 4 HP, i got to make sure I take him out. And he's shrouded, meaning he can only be targeted by adjacent units. Well, that's fine, because I'm, I am uh, a melee unit. And he also rolls this tyrant die, and if he rolls this, he can't take damage from attack dice until his next turn. But that doesn't apply to skill dice. And if you roll this, all units friendly to mall mesh, there aren't going to be any, so um, that won't apply. Okay, so we're going to set up the tyrant battle. Only mall mesh is going to come out. I got a five, so I'm in second place on the initiative meter, and I guess I might as well put myself right here. I'll roll my two defense dice for my innate skill. I got two ones. That's nice. Okay, it is Molmesh's turn. Remember, he's rolling one attack die and his tyrant die, and if he doesn't get a bone, he rolls it again. Okay, so he rolled this, meaning he's immune from normal attack dice until his next turn. And he hit me for one, and he gets to roll it again. So I get to roll again. I made that sound like there's an advantage. So he has two hits against me. Um, one bounces off there, here. One bounces off here. Okay, and now I cannot hit him with normal attack dice. And it's nice knowing that, so because I, I won't bother wasting it. I won't, I won't roll them. So it is now my turn. What do I want to roll here? Well, I can't roll attack dice against him. I'll roll one defense. I'll roll repost. And I'll roll situational awareness. Okay, so I get one hit against him thanks to my constant damage. So one comes off of... Uh, of him. I got a defensive die. I got a switch, which does me no good. I'll put that back. I got a rush, which I could use to move into the corner, and then he won't be able to reach me. And then I have to spend one dex to reach him. I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll use this instantly. I get to move three spaces at no dexterity cost. So I'll go one, two, three, and go into the corner. And that's fine, because it's a skill that's allowing me to do that. And we're going into round two. Momesh will move two spaces toward me. He is not adjacent. He's not able to attack. He still rolls his um, tyrant die. So I'll turn off auto and exhaust his attack die and just roll his tyrant die. Alternatively, I could have rolled both dice and just ignored the attack die result. Um, he got that again, so I can't um, can't affect him with normal attack dice. I'll put a t auto back on. It's my turn. I will move one space. Can't roll attack dice. Can't roll defense dice. So I'll roll rush and situational awareness. So I hit him for one from constant damage. I got a repost, which I'll put in an active slot. I could use this instantly and again run away, but I can't really run away at this point because he's pinned me against the edge. So even if I could move three spaces, he's still going to reach me. So this is going back to my mat. And um, round three. And we're still at full health, so this is looking good. He has the frenzy skill. Okay, so now he is attack dice can hit him, can affect him. He hit me for one and he gets to roll it again. Okay, so he's got three attack against me. I could use the repost. And avoid it. Or 
or I could just exhaust all my defense dice. Um, he's at five health. Next turn, I'll get him down to four, and then I'll have to hit him hard. No, I'm going to take one more round. So I am going to. I'm not going to use my repost. I'm going to just take. Uh, I got three hits, so one comes off here. Except he is vulnerable to attack now. But I'm really not ready to hit him. I want to get him to four before I go whole hog. So I'm going to not use repost. So I'm going to uh, one here, one here, and one here. No damage. The three attack get blocked. So it's my turn. I will roll. Um, not ready to roll attack yet. I will roll, um, I still have the repost, so I'll roll two defensive dice and my rush die. See if I can get another repost. That would be nice. I didn't. I got a rush. And that's, that does me no good, so I'll put that away, and I will Put these into active slots, and it is now. Um, and now I take, I hit him for one, thanks to constant damage, and we're going into round four. Yeah, I didn't want to hit him because I can't. If I get him to three, he's going to retreat, and I can't let him get to three, which is why I didn't roll attack dice last turn. Okay, so it's his turn. I gotta turn um, auto back on. Okay. He, um, I can't hit him yet. Oh no, this is tricky. If I get too close to the tee grounds, I'm in trouble. Can't use attack dice on him. He hits me for one, and he rolls again. Hit me for two. So one comes off here, one comes off here. My turn. I can't roll attack dice against him. Oh man, when we get into the fatigue round, I'm in trouble because then he'll retreat. I gotta really hope that he doesn't roll that die next time. Alright, I'm rolling. Um, one defensive die and both of these. Wow, double repost. I only have one slot open. Uh, so I am going to put um, nine into my active slot. I will ignore this and I'll put that back on the mat. So now. This is perfect. Now I can use this, my double repost, to hit him back for three when he attacks me. Great. We're going into round five. Molmesh rolls to attack Pickett. Okay. I can't attack him with normal attack dice, but that's okay. He hits me for one, but he rolls again. He got a bone, so now he hit me for one. That bounces off my shields. But he hit me for one, and I can use this to avoid the attack and use this to hit him back for three. And he won't retreat because it's not the beginning of his turn. He only retreats here. I can cover this at the start of his turn. So uh, I exhaust both of these dice. I hit him for three damage. I don't take any damage myself, and it's my turn, and now I don't, it doesn't matter. He's dead because he only has one health, and constant damage will take him out. I don't have to roll a thing. I have won the game. And there you go. There you have it, folks. Hope you enjoyed that. We wrapped it up in the seven days thanks to having those offsets. 
but I hope, uh, especially for you guys who are new to the game, hope this gives you a real good idea of how it plays. It is great. It's even better with multiple gear locks when you're ready to do that. It's lots of fun with lots of people, but the program is going to be free. It's going to be available at the, near the beginning of August 2017. So check out the uh, check out this video. Check out the video playlist that talks about all the features that I didn't cover in this video, and um, and uh, you'll be able to download this in a couple of weeks. And or depending upon when you see this video, maybe you'll be able to download it right away and uh, use it for free. So thanks everybody. Hope you enjoyed this. Bye bye for now.